Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is Videocast Episode 102, Podcast Episode 92 for the week ending Thursday, September 30th, 2021. I've been doing a lot more of these on Thursdays because I play uh, hockey on Saturday mornings, and we're up at 5.30 a.m. to do that. So uh, you'll forgive me if uh, doing a late podcast on Fridays is a little tougher, but we, we get them in on Thursdays or Fridays. And uh, let's get right down to it this week. Uh, first, I want to thank Ellie Terrett and Liz Clayman for having me on the Clayman Countdown on Friday. Uh, we discussed uh, Nike was selling off that day on supply chain issues as well as the general market outlook, which we're going to get in a little more granular in the article of the week. So thanks for having me on. Also want to thank Devik Jane for having me uh, in his article last Friday. Um, my quote there was, we're taking a breather, we're taking a breather from the two-day rally, but uh, there's some uncertainty about China. Market wants a little clarity on. That was with regard to Evergrande, which we'll touch on uh, in this week's video cast. But the key theme is to shift back to the value reopening and cyclical trade, and we should expect to see a move back uh, into reopening into the end of the year in the face of a rising interest rate environment. So that's going to be a theme of what we'll touch on this week as well. And then also want to thank Devik for having me in his article yesterday. Uh, Rate-sensitive tech stocks got a boost as the 10-year uh, yields fell after jumping 20 basis points. Okay, so my quote was, it's all coming down to the 10-year yield, the rate of change. The reason you're seeing a little relief today is because it's not going straight up. It's taking a bit of a breather, and the market likes that. The only game in town right now is going to be equities until those yields go up more materially and people can earn something in fixed income. There's nothing to com compete with equities and that's why you're seeing every three to 5% dip bought. So we're still in that three to 5% uh, dip range. I think the uh, S&P is about 4%, although uh, we're closing a little stronger into the close. So maybe, you know, three, 3.75% uh, 3, 3. off the uh, recent highs uh, and these dips are, are generally bought. A um, couple quick things I thought were interesting. Um, I thought that I saw this article earlier in the week, and it said Warren Buffett used the Mona Lisa, the famous uh, painting, to explain why art is a terrible investment, but then compared Berkshire Hathaway to an art museum. Well, the point he made was, and I love when he does these long-term comparisons in his articles. We we've covered. Um, gold versus the stock market. I think it was 1948 to 2018. If you invested $10,000 in the stock market, it would be worth 53 million. If you had invested 10,000 in gold, it was worth like 500,000 or so something to that effect. And the net effect was it cost you $50 million to put your money in gold over the stock market over a you know 70 year period. And he made the same case as it relates to art. And there's a lot of mania right now going on with NFTs and uh, digital tokens and that type of thing. Um, in his 1963 annual letter, uh, Buffett laid out the case that uh, Francis I, the former king of France, bought Leonardo da, da Vinci's Mona Lisa in 1540 for 4,000 gold, gold crowns or the equivalent of $20,000. If the monarch had plowed that money into an investment generating a modest after-tax return of 6% a year, the country's coffers would be overflowing with more than one quadrillion dollars by 1963 or 3,000 times its national debt. Uh, meanwhile, the Mona Lisa uh, was not valued at one quadrillion dollars. It was valued at 100 million in 1962 uh, or about 900 million in today's dollars. So it just goes to show when everyone's worried about um, uh, short-term bumps or um, alternative assets, et cetera, et cetera. When you have a piece of the highest quality businesses that compound over time, uh, you really can't beat that. And um, I thought what was also interesting as it relates to Buffett was, I, I don't know who put this out. I think it was Dividend Growth Investor or one of these guys. And I was looking at Buffett's net worth. Now, obviously, this is a, an arithmetic table. It's not uh, logarithmic, uh, a log logarithmic chart. So it looks like, you know, all of his money was made after age 50, which is largely true uh, in terms of absolute dollars. But 
Uh, I thought what was really interesting was this period from uh, 19, from, from when he was, so he had accumulated about a $20 million net worth by, by age 40. By age 43, it was up to 34 million. And again, this was, you know, uh, some time ago. So 50 years ago, uh, you know, 1970 terms. Uh, that's, you know, a lot more, you know, it's, uh, I don't know what it is, 10 to 1, 9 to 1. But anyway, it's 25 million. Then he went up to 34 million by age 43. And if you look at this drop from age 43 to age 44, uh, his net worth dropped by about 60%. It went from 34 million down to 19 million. And then three years later, it was up to 67 million. And it goes to show you, um, you know, if in this period, when it went from 34 to 19, if he had sold out of those assets that he thought had a reasonable value at age 43, that cut in half at age 44, uh, by age 47, he wouldn't would not have rebounded um, at all, uh, and uh, and this story would have turned out a lot differently. So uh, it's it's important to keep in mind it's not just timing the market; it's time in the market. But that was quite a wipeout at age 43 to be down 60 percent, uh, and then just hang in there, and it tripled as the market came back. Uh, and the assets came back, and then you know uh, by 50 he was worth the you know uh, more than 10x what he was worth at 40, and then by 60 he was worth uh, about 10x, and then it just went off the charts because you get the snowball, which which was the book. So um, really, really interesting to see how slowly it builds and then how it just compounds into something big, and also in those trying periods to stay put. If you're buying quality that's on sale, uh, it comes back and you're rewarded and that's how you compound big time over time by doing that and not getting distracted by, uh, you know, um, people or strategies that, that make, you know, money in, in the very, very short term, but never can achieve heights like this uh, over the intermediate term because they're, they know the price of everything and the value of nothing. And, and that, um, while it can work in weeks or months, it rarely works in uh, years or decades. And that's where uh, the big rewards come, not just for Warren Buffett, for, but for hundreds of people who have followed a similar philosophy over the years, whether uh, in real estate, whether in buying businesses, whether in public securities, etc. Okay, now... Um, want to get on to uh, the questions of the week from our uh, viewers and listeners. Uh, first is from Tim Good. Uh, in mid-May, you shared mortgage companies, Rocket, United Wholesale Mortgage Corp, and Loan Depot. These were long-term opportunities with millennials entering the housing market. Yeah, this this basket. So uh, but, 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 with the anticipated rate hikes early next year and rising 10-year, do you think these companies will get a buy? Would these companies participate in the reopening trade? Um, okay, so uh, yeah, this basket, uh, no change in outlook. So the reason they're beaten down is because the market is estimating that rates are going to go up very, very quickly. Uh, and it's going to destroy the refinancing business, which was a huge part of their revenue. And what we found in 2013 the last time there was a taper and we covered it a bit in the article of the week i'll just pull it up quickly here is that the biggest move in rates was not because of tapering it was in anticipation of tapering so if you look they signaled that they wanted to taper in may uh may 1st of 2013 they thought they were going to do it in june they didn't wind up actually uh doing it until december and the 10-year yield went from 161 basis points to 300 basis points in that seven-month period. So we've gone from 120, about 120 basis points since they signaled in uh, Jackson Hole and re-emphasized last month. Now we're up about 155 basis points we hit uh, in the last couple of weeks, up from 120. So call it, um, you know, 35 bips off the lows in August. And... Uh, well, we were at 112, so call it, um, you know, four, 43 bips or whatever it was uh, in a short period of time. 
But, you know, let's assume they're not going to announce in November. I know people are calling for November 2nd. Uh, the reason they won't, in my view, is because the September jobs report is not going to be good enough. And if you go back to his press conference, he said, you know, inflation, substantial further progress has been met, but full employment has not. What all I would need is almost, but not. Uh, all I would need to see is a decent jobs report. Now, uh, August reported in September was not a decent. They were expecting 750,000 uh, jobs uh, and they got... Um, they got uh, less than a third of that, I think 223,000 jobs. So uh, my guess, because of Delta and because of the similar conditions that caused um, that caused the August report in September report to be a disaster, I think those conditions are still prevalent in September with the first two weeks was uh, uh, a mania of fear around Delta. Uh, so I'm sure that slowed hiring. I'm sure it will miss. Uh, that said, the October with cases rolling over and uh, benefits rolling off, it's likely the October jobs report, which comes out in November, which will be after their meeting, uh, several days after their meeting, will likely uh, be a good enough report, i.e. a quote-unquote decent report, such that they can announce taper in December if they want to. They will also, because the meeting in December is in the middle of the month as it was in 2013, um, have the November jobs report in hand. So barring some crazy variant or re-spike of uh, COVID or, or something like that, my guess is both the October and November reports will be decent enough, if not beating expectations such that in December, they announced taper and probably an implementation in, in early uh, 2022 is my best guess. So, um, uh, so, so my point is that in the short term, there's this fear of this aggressive rise in rates. Um, if history is any clue, when they actually implement will be the peak in rates. And our view is that the refinancing business will not be as decimated as people anticipate, number one. And number two, I think the supply of houses is going to come on full steam as the supply bottlenecks um, alleviate that there's going to be a huge amount of origination uh, in coming years. You have to keep in mind that the millennials are now bigger than uh, they're bigger than the baby boomers and they're just in that housing formation uh, period and then with jobs being created jobs are the number one indicator for for uh, housing formation and for uh, other than age uh, and starting families etc i think all the components are going to be there that these businesses will do really well they're trading at uh, uh, you know mid to high single digit multiples uh, and the demand is going to be excessive once the supply is available for them to purchase at reasonable prices or in sizes that give them reasonable prices. Uh, and we'll talk about the cost of ownership because many people have been talking about uh, calling for big everything bubbles because uh, housing prices are high, but we're going to talk about the cost of ownership is actually near record lows. Uh, and uh, and how that's going to drive things forward. So, yeah, I like this basket. This is one of those that you just set and forget. You buy a basket and you look in three, three four years and, you know, you've got a, a an aggregate basket that's probably up two, three, four, five X. Uh, and that's when you peel it off when the cycle is up. So uh, no change there. Uh, found another company that has been sold heavily that pays a high dividend yield while you wait. AGNC Investment Corp yields 9%. Uh, I do listen to you and remember you saying any yield over 5% is a warning signal. Yeah, these these companies just buy uh, mortgage-backed securities. I, I would pass on that. Um, they're, they're like um, uh, Annalee Capital. They tend to go nowhere. And if they're over levered and rates rise too quickly, you could have some some disruption. I, I, I just I just wouldn't play there. And you're not going to get capital appreciation and you're going to pay. Uh, I think you're probably going to pay ordinary income on those uh, uh, distributions. So um, I, I'd, I'd probably pass on those. Uh, next is Ben first name only. What are your thoughts short term regarding crude oil based on. Uh, commitment of traders 
positioning. Um, you know, look, uh, I, 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 I hate answering these questions after they've had such a big run. Um, I always feel like this is late. I had a friend texting me, um, you know, rates are going up. Your bank stocks are going to love it. Well, you know, we've made the majority of our money in banks. Anything from here is a, is a trade. Um, uh, so, you know, looking at the commitment of traders here, you're seeing commercial hedgers have been net buyers um, uh, and, and the commodity has moved up to $75. I think one thing you have to worry about, and I know I said it over the summer and it didn't materialize, is the um, Iran nuclear talks, uh, and, and this came out today, this is actually from Haaretz newspaper, is an Israeli newspaper, it said, Iran nuclear talks to resume soon, says senior EU official, um, and uh, the uh, stall talks... Uh, so they didn't specify when, but there was another report from Reuters that an Iranian official implied within weeks. So sometime in the month of October, and it says here, uh, Joe Biden aims to restore the deal, but the sides disagree on which steps need to be taken and when, with the key issues being what nuclear limits Tehran will accept and what sanctions uh, Washington will remove. Look, Europe is panicking. They need more oil production. They need, uh, Iran needs the U.S. to lift the sanctions. And when that happens, you're going to see a supply of oil come on the market, which in the short term, you know, if you're in oil stocks or if you're in uh, crude futures, uh, you, you could get, you know, 5 to 20% pullback on that news because it's going to extrapolate and it's going to take the market a little by surprise because everyone's forgot about this deal. This this administration wants to do a deal with Iran. It's just a question of timing and COVID and all that other stuff that they've been distracted with. So um, I, I would just keep your eyes open on this. You know, when uh, oil stocks were down this summer, um, you'll, you'll remember here, August and September, the only new name we were we were talking about aggressively was EOG. And it's had a nice run. So you know, over the next three to five years, do I think these things work out higher? Yeah, uh, no question. But, you know, again, the big money has been made off the bottom in these. Um, some of the ones that have left behind, like there are some refiners, like PSX would probably be a better play where you're going to play the spread, crack spreads. Um, VLO is another one. So I, I think you just, you know, and then some of the uh, midstreams, like energy transfer is interesting. KMI is interesting. I think you just need to get more selective here because if you do get an Iran deal, the refiners, uh, the downstream and the midstream will be less affected than the upstream. Uh, there's still some opportunity in upstream. Uh, some of the natural gas players obviously have had big runs um, and are breaking out. And I think these things will per persist. But I think if you don't have exposure, you, you, you probably want to wait until you get some type of news like that from from an Iran deal or something else that uh, just knocks the wind because it's been on a run here. Uh, and if you do have exposure, uh, you know, great. I mean, we, we have a ton of exposure from last year at much lower prices, and we're probably not going to give up much of that. Um, but, you know, if we get huge pushes higher in some of these names like uh, Exxon and... Um, and others, we, we, we will trim. You know, there's no question we'll trim um, and, and find better places to put money. Uh, and your short-term thoughts on XLU. Well, XLU, I mean, you could see it's basically traded sideways for the last two years. Uh, and it does that. You know, it did the same exact thing from the uh, signaling of taper to the implementation. And after taper was implemented, it took off again. So, uh, you know, this area here was when you had the signal of taper, rates rose, these things ground sideways, and then when they actually implemented the taper, uh, rates peaked and, and utilities took off. So, you know, I think you want to be selective. You can use this opportunity weakness to be building them over the next five months in anticipation of the taper. Uh, and then once they actually do the taper, you'll probably start to get a bid again in, in those. So uh, short term, you know, weeks, I have no clue. Uh, but but over the coming months, I, I would I would use the opportunity in selective names to get some exposure because when they do announce that they're going to get a new leg. It's, it's just the opposite of what everyone thinks. What everyone thinks is that when the Fed stops buying bonds, rates are going to go through the moon. 
what what's actually going to happen is rates will probably creep up to 10-year yields will creep up to somewhere between 2 and 250 by Q1. Um, best guess in the middle, 220 bips, somewhere in there. And then um, when the taper is actually implemented, that will be the peak in yields for some time. In the case of 2014, it was five years. Yields never got higher than uh, 3% until 2018. Uh, moving on to my favorite subject, which is China <laughs> and the cause of a, a choppy quarter. But uh, nonetheless, I, I, I feel um, um, I just feel great about what this summer has served up the last couple of months in terms of positioning for year end and into next year. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's as good in some pockets of the markets as uh, April of 2000 was and right before the election of 2000, uh, of 2000 was uh, in terms of uh, just different groups that you could get involved in and what happened afterwards. And I think as I look through the market and we, we went through a number of stocks in, in the last two weeks and we'll touch on what they're doing and, and the opportunities moving forward. Uh, but this China thing is, is so... Um, I wouldn't say predictable because every headline seems arbitrary and capricious. But if you look back over the last 10 years and you look at the 30 to 40 percent corrections that came in the MSCI China every single three to four years over the last, you know, dozen years, uh, it's almost it's like it's right on time. It's right according to script and it's behaving exactly the same way. Now, um just the the one positive that I covered in recent weeks was that I think it was on Kitco, but that the Evergrande negative would potentially turn out to be an aggressive positive because the regulation plus the tightening six months ago, uh, plus now the ripple effects of the uh, debt default um, are going to force China's hand at Bank of China and um, to uh, start aggressive easing. And we saw it last week. China added $71 billion in cash to calm nerves as it relates to the Evergrande, and they won't stop there. And I think what we're going to see this month is that they're actually going to cut rates uh, and it's going to start to be very, very stimulative. And BlackRock put out a note uh, a couple days ago it's time to increase investment in Chinese stocks as the risks of government intervention are already priced in, BlackRock says. Uh, I agree. And, um, and then the Evergrande thing is is going according to what we said two weeks ago, which was reported widely uh, in the papers, or, or I don't know if that was two weeks ago or last week, but it was before everyone else was talking about it. And that's basically that um, uh, Evergrande is going to sell pieces to state-owned entities and basically nationalize and ring fence this whole thing. Uh, so that, you know, shareholders, yes, U.S. dollar denominated bondholders, yes, they'll get hurt, they'll get haircutted, but uh, the uh, local wealth management products, the yield product holders, as well as the apartment holders and um, uh, the uh, yuan denominated uh, bonds uh, should be, should come out whole. Um and here, here it is. So we said this, I believe it was on last week's podcast, China asking state-backed firms to pick up Evergrande's assets. Uh, if you remember, we pointed to the sources at Asia Markets who said that it would be broken up into three uh, state-backed uh, entities moving forward. Uh, and that seems to be slowly taking place. The other article came out today. I thought this was great about the VIE structures, which have been around for 20 years. And every time you have these 30 to 40 percent corrections, everyone says they're going to take away the VIE structure. This was an article by uh, Jing Yang in the Wall Street Journal this morning. And the key quote I thought of, uh, I thought was um, key was that uh, was from Marcia Ellis. So she says, concerns that the Chinese securities regulators might outlaw the VIE structure are overblown, according to Marcia Ellis, Hong Kong-based partner at law firm Morrison and Forrester. Uh, the fact that the Shanghai Stock Exchange has allowed VIE structured companies to list is a sign of validation, she said. So um, what the CSRC would like to have is 
approval rights over the ex-China listing of offshore incorporated companies with their assets and operations in China, whether they use VIE structures or not. So, uh, and they've already signaled this. They just want approval before new ones go. And that's, uh, that's all falling into place. The other thing that I pulled up, which I thought was interesting, um, was this divergence. What I have here, this red line, is the QQQ, which is basically the US NASDAQ or US tech. Um, there's nuances, but just, just keep it simple, versus the CQQ, which is the Chinese equivalent of the NASDAQ or China tech. Um, and there are, you know, you would think mostly these trade together because they're like big tech, but there have been a couple instances where they diverged, meaning the US tech was going up materially while China tech was collapsing. And they create kind of this, what I call a fish mouth, where, you know, this black line is the China tech and the red line is the uh, US tech, and they're going in opposite directions. And uh, this happened the last time in 2000, 2012 to 2013 period. And what happened was you saw a monster catch up in the China tech uh, as the US tech kept plowing higher. And I think that the setup is similar here. You, you, this divergence between China tech underperforming US tech, which is uh, held strong, uh, is material. And you could say, well, the way this is going to converge is that US tech is going to collapse. Uh, I, yeah, I doubt that. So uh, not, not while this liquidity is in place. Uh, maybe they have a little bit more correction, but I think that the, the divergence will uh, realign and converge as China tech starts to get bid. And we're going to go through some, some reasons why. Um, this, I got the idea for this uh, Tiho Brocken, B-R-K-A-N on Twitter, uh, put out a similar chart with, with regard to the RSI. But when I looked at it, uh, there were some nuances that I thought were really important to cover. Uh, he was just talking generally about the RSI, which was which was useful. And, you know, as, as he qualified, and I'm going to qualify, an RSI indicator is, you know, a, a barometer at best. You can't count on it to make a trade or anything like that. But when you look out through history, it's kind of interesting because – in the case of BABA, it's only been at these levels. Um, this will be the third time in the history of its trading. And what happens is it crashes because the Chinese government does some type of crackdown. Like in 18, it was video games. In 15, 16, it was uh, the, the credit markets and energy, etc. So um, what happens is it hits this extreme RSI. And then you get a little bounce. And then it, it retests. And that this retest is when the market takes off. And then in the case of 2016, you saw BABA rally 97% in, you know, nine months, okay? And probably half that, which was 50% in about two or three months. So um, the same thing happened in 2018. You get this first deep bounce in the RSI, and then you get this retest rollover, and that's when you get the big move, and it moved 54% in, again, three, four months. Uh, and, and what's interesting is they tend to move up to this first level of um, kind of cluster after they roll over. So now, look, this is not useful in any type of investment type of mindset. It's just an observation of history of the behavior, and behaviors have a tendency to repeat. We're going to go into, you know, we've gone into the fundamentals. We're going to reemphasize that. But uh, we picked up some more stock this week. I mean, we, we just think that it, it, it's become so priced in the regulation. And um, there aren't many other franchises of this magnitude growing at this pace that you can buy this inexpensively if you're willing to just sit through the short-term pain um it it doesn't exist out there you you just can't you can't find it so um so what's interesting about both of these times so so off that second rsi test they rallied 50 and 100% 50% on the first move was a matter of a couple of months to i think two months in both instances to this first peak and then you know they they were both up more than 100% after that um within a year or so now 
uh, we've said that we believe the intrinsic value is somewhere around 300. And then as the governor lets the foot off their neck, then uh, it could be a four or $500 stock, you know, five to 10 years out. But leaving that aside, that initial bounce um, tends to go to this first level of breakdown. So it, it crashes off of its top and then there's a lot of sideways consolidation. It crashes off its top, it's a lot of sideways consolidation. And that seems to be the level where it, 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 it rebounds to before you know checking back and then moving. Same thing here. It rebounded to this first kind of plateau level. After the first crash, it plateaus. After the first crash, it plateaus. And that's where it seems to rebound to. And here, here again, this is that first crashes and this is that first plateau level, which would imply you know, 260, 270 bucks on the first bounce. I mean, that's that's certainly optimistic, but relative to performance and relative to um, uh, its its earnings power, it's not unrealistic. The question is going to be the timing, but we are at that second bounce. You've got the first deep RSI, you've got the second RSI bounce here, and then the question is, do we get this quick abrupt bounce? And I think it, I think that may be the case. And I also think that part of the selling pressure, every institution under the sun was puking out of this stock in Q, uh, what quarter are we in? Three. Um, so no one wanted to show it on their books into the end of the, the quarter. Uh, so, you know, there was just no bid on this stock for the last few months. Um, I, I think that could change. And what will be the catalyst? We never know. But it's at a level where there are just basically no sellers left. I mean, and that's probably what it looked like these two times when you got the check back. And, and here we are with the check back uh, moving forward. Now, uh, Tio put out this fundamental table, which is great because it just lays out what you pay and what you get. So the blue line is revenues and how they've grown over the last five years. The black line is net income and how that's grown over the last five years. And then uh, the green uh, line is cash flow from operations. And that, that's the most important in my view. And you see that it, this is just a compounder. And there are very few franchises that are just consistent compounders like this. Um, and, and, you know, to give you an idea, it's you're buying it at 2007 levels. And the top line is almost five times what it was in 2017. You know, the bottom line is uh, three times. Uh, bottom line is probably three or four times. Uh, cash flow is more than triple. So, you know, if you can buy something that was reasonably valued in 2017, uh, and now the business is five times bigger, the cash it generates is, you know, three or four times bigger, and it's the same price, these are the exogenous events in the short term that cause the franchise to be misappraised, like Buffett always talks about. And you either step in and you, you take the risk because, look, you don't get misappraised by this magnitude if there's not real fear and there's not legitimate risk. I mean, that's that's just the way it goes. Um, but that said, um, it, it's a it's a chronic repetitive cycle in China and you could say well this time is going to be different and now the governors that they're going to place on this company uh, are, are going to lead them to no longer be a compounder. I would say the opposite is true. They've had big growth abroad. Their AWS is growing at 29% um, and I think it's going to incentivize them to invest more in Southeast Asia outside of their country and get huge international growth as well as play by the rules in China and still have the huge moat. Um, just to compound what you're seeing visibly, uh, you know, their last earnings report, they had a 22% rise in, in quarterly profits. Revenue increased 46% year on year to $31.9 billion. It had 1.18 billion annual active customers during the 12 months that ended in, in June on June 30th, which was up 45 million from the previous quarter sequentially. It reported 939 mobile active users, which was up 14 million sequentially, and it increased their buyback program by five billion dollars to 15 billion dollars. Uh, their cloud computing revenue was up 29 percent to two and a half billion dollars. Uh, and um, and the same thing happened the quarter before where their earnings rose 30 percent 
uh, their revenue jumped 46%, and their cloud computing business grew by 50% year over year in that quarter. So, uh, you know, the company has a five-year annual annualized earnings growth rate of 29%, and you're buying it at give or take uh, 15 times next year's earnings, even though they're going to be they're estimated to be flattish. In the short term, I think that that is just going to be a short term hiccup, and I think they're going to be much, much better than expected after this noise all blows over. Um, and uh, and then they're expected to uh, move back up to 20 percent earnings growth for fiscal 2023. So, um, you know, these are one of those situations that you have to accept some short term pain, like when we were buying Wells Fargo at 28, it went down to 22 before it went up to 50. So you know, uh, it's just part of the process. And, uh, and, and we, uh, we use the opportunity this week to add, uh, sentiment trader put this out. This is with regard to buybacks in 10 cent. And you're also seeing and going to continue to see the same in Alibaba. Um, they, they had their fourth highest amount of buybacks on record in the past 30 days. So these companies, if 10 cent believed that the regulation was going to put them out of business, the last thing they would be doing is using all of their available cash to buy back their own stock. But if you look back at the last four times that they did that, it was effectively at or near the bottom and they had huge rallies afterwards. So in 2005, they did this amount of buybacks. In 2008, they did this amount of buybacks. In 2011, 2013, and uh, today they're doing that level of buyback. So if they didn't have confidence in the future, they'd be conserving that cash instead they're buying the cash and to i think ben asked the question a few weeks ago uh why don't companies buy their stocks when they're down why do they always buy them when they're up well the chinese you know tencent has it figured out this is the opportunity to in time to be buying stock and you want to be buying right along with them and that's why alibaba increased their buyback authorization by five billion dollars as well so um so that's that going into a new quarter i think we'll probably start to see some tailwinds as most of the sellers are out of the stock and, and now they can put it back on their books into year end uh, for, for, for a bounce. Um, okay, so just going through the general uh, market barometers here, we'll do these quick because we've done them in the past couple of weeks and we're going to cover it in the um, article of the week. You know, most of these are closer to buy points than sell points. Uh, and that's really the theme I want to get across here. You know, healthcare stocks. We love Cigna here. Um, uh, Dow intermediate term breath momentum. You know, all of these, particularly as it relates to the reopening, but also uh, as it relates to, oh, this is interesting. National Association of Active Investment Managers. This dropped down to 55. They, they recorded this print this afternoon, which is really good. This is a level where you usually get a bounce. Because if the market ticks up from here, they all got to chase back in. This is really good to see. We were waiting. They've been up here in the 70s and 80s the last couple of weeks. It's nice to see they've puked out into the quarter end close. Uh, and now they'll have to play catch up. PMO buy all. Again, you know, you want to be a buyer down near zero um, and uh, seller or lightening up when it's at 100. Uh, it's, it's down at these levels. So most of these things are, are pointing favorably to uh, good things ahead. Uh, people are obviously nervous about uh, October, but October in um, uh, this part of the election cycle tends to be like the fourth best month of the year, as opposed to historically, it's the seventh best month of the year. Ryan Dietrich put out some stats on that earlier today, but the point of it was September's bad, October's not as bad as everyone thinks it is. So uh, that was that. And uh, this is uh, even with the NASDAQ McClellan summation, this is, you know, this is closer to buy area versus sell. I know people are getting nervous about tech and maybe there's a little more bloodletting to do there. But uh, these things are all kind of pointing to the same thing. Odds are favoring leaning into some of the stocks that um, that have been weak. Um, OK, so Dietrich put out uh, over at LPL when you've had. We've had a seven month win streak in the general indices. What happens? Well, in the first month, um, you average 1.2% returns, but one, two, three, four, five 
instances since 1954, you got a negative. Uh, we got a negative in September. Uh, but if you look three months out, the average return is 4.1%, which would make sense into year end. We've talked about uh, mid mid uh, single digit gain. Uh, and um, so three months out is 4.1 average, six months out is 7.9 average, and 12 months out is 9.5% uh, average return. So those are always fun to look at. Global COVID cases continue to go in the right direction, U.S. as well. That's good. The positivity rate is down. I uh, want to get to the U.S. stocks. We've been pounding the table on Boeing after the Fed talk. It got a huge bid um, and uh, a lot of good things have been happening. So analyst positive on Boeing after a successful 737 MAX test flight in China, which we've said is going to be the next big catalyst. catalyst. Executives expect certification by the end of 2021. So uh, that is huge news. Next thing is Boeing stock is rising after getting good news from an unusual source. This was Durable Goods orders. What they basically, Durable, durable Goods beat, and what they calculated was the vast majority of that pointed to uh, uh, Boeing. Uh, let's see. The reason for the beat is essentially Boeing, excluding transportation equipment orders, gained just 0.2%. Economists were expecting uh, 0.5%. The Durable Goods orders actually came in one percent 8% uh, versus a 0.7% increase. So so basically 1.6% of that they're attributing to transportation expenditures, which, you know, the vast majority is going to be Boeing. And, uh, and that's going to bode well for earnings uh, and outlook moving forward. So that's a big deal. Uh, the other thing is Delta CEO came out this week, sees a quote unquote place for the 737 MAX in their fleet. Um, uh, is the airline eyes opportunistic deals to revamp its fleet over the next decade. Airline Weekly's Edward Russell reported yesterday, noting that this would be the carrier's first big Boeing order in a decade. No news to report if we can figure out how to bring them in. So um, so that's exciting. So you got the China Catalyst. You've got the upgrades from uh, Bernstein actually upgraded them. Um, you've got Delta. Uh, both Boeing and Spirit were upgraded to outperform at Bernstein on expectations for recovery and air travel. I think they took their price target to either 265 or 270, somewhere in that range. I think that's a good short-term target. I think long-term it pushes higher. These were the stocks we put out on the 16th when we said, don't worry about the summer swoon. Focus on those stocks that, I'm sorry, don't focus on the September swoon. Focus on those stocks that ha already had a summer swoon. And then after everyone kind of gets them off their books in, into the end of the quarter, I think these are going to be the ones to lead in Q4 and Q1. Um, so uh, obviously Uber had a bounce after that. Las Vegas Sands, again, this is all the China story. I think these are going to be monsters. I, I just, uh, Las Vegas Sands and Wynn, I think these are just opportunities. You know, and if they take three more months to get going, so what? You know, once they double, it's, th these are, just incredible franchises. We talked about the refiners, uh, Activision Blizzard, I think got an upgrade, but these are just stocks that have been beat up that are, are finally, I think, going to get bid. Baba, we talked about ad infinitum, um, but this, this is where value is. So if people are saying that we're in an everything bubble and stocks are too high, just, you know, go through these couple dozen. Lockheed Martin started to get bid in the last few weeks. I think this is going to push, push to new highs. Um, Cigna, we, we just love this into year end. And um, uh, uh, Southwest started to move in the reopening trade after the meeting. Boeing started to move the reopening trade. But again, there's still huge value. You just have to know where to look. And now that the quarter's over, I think that uh, it, it's created an opportunity to, to get exposure if you don't have it yet, uh, in our opinion. And go to hedgefundtips.com, click on terms, um, talk with your own financial advisor. We don't know your situation and um, act accordingly. So top-down, bottom-up stock market and sentiment results. So the CMT Association, they're like the CFA for technical analysts. Uh, they asked me to do an article to explain how we use charts in our investment selection process. And the answer is we, we, we use... We spend 80% of our time on fundamental analysis and, and maybe 20% on uh, technicals as barometers to assist with entry and exit. 
And when I say barometers, I mean that in its widest sense. At best, they're barometers, uh, but they, they're helpful. And, uh, and we went through some on this call today, so we, we hope you found that helpful as well. Now, um, what we try to do is we do top down and then bottom up. So as it relates to technicals on the market, we do a top down on the general indices to get a sense of whether it makes sense to be aggressively adding risk or lightening up since no single indicator is os or oscillator is foolproof. We try to look at a few dozen to see if they're pointing to the same probabilities. We just went through a few pages of those. There are you know a few hundred of them. Most of the time they line up, uh, but sometimes they diverge in their readings and that's when you have to be careful and it's a little bit more nuanced. Right now they're all kind of pointing in the same direction. Now, while many technical analysts prefer to buy when there's high relative strength or blue skies on breakouts, we, we after they're already up 80 and 100%, we prefer to buy high quality durable franchises when they're on sale. We're looking for periods when selling is at or near exhaustion versus buying when everyone is already clamoring for the stock or sector. While this may require slightly more patience, uh, as building bottoms can take time, if you've done the proper fundamental analysis and you know what you own, as well as understand the time value of money, buying quality when trading below intrinsic value, and selling when the masses are exuberant for the company after it's exceeded intrinsic value. Uh, it, this is a process that has created material wealth for practitioners over many generations and through many cycles. And if you look at those people, either hedge fund managers or investment managers um, uh, or investors who are on the Forbes 400, um, you know, you you really won't find any that 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 were buying companies after they doubled and tripled uh, to catch you know the next twenty percent move for a quick run. It's it's people who buy things high quality companies when they're out of favor and then flip them when they come back back into favor. And you probably find a similar situation with real estate people on Forbes four hundred. And then of course you have people who create companies like the Bezos and the and the um, Musk and, and that's a whole different type of wealth. Um, but um, but the, you know this is a slower, surer, clearer path to compound over time. And if you look at Buffett, um, you know it takes a little time, and then once you get get your capital up to 30, 50, 100 million, that's when things really just start to fly. So, um, and it happens overnight. It, it, it's staggering when you consider, um, you know, he's worth 100 billion. He gave away 100 billion already. So, you know, call it 200 billion. So he basically went from 2 billion to 200 billion in 30 years. I mean, anyway, it, it it's, uh, it's that. So, um, so you know, we went through these charts. You know, when these are at lower points, it, it makes more sense to be a net buyer uh, on balance. Then once we get a feel for the market, we want to see which sectors are on sale. So uh, we drill down, and when we've determined what is at or near selling exhaustion, we do a deep dive into fundamental analysis to determine why. Sometimes stocks and sectors are cheap for a reason. We look to identify catalysts that will turn the tide in a reasonable amount of time. We use the sector barometers like percent of stocks in a sector above their 20 and 50 day moving averages, bullish percent by sector that, that's related to point and figure, which we don't use, but we do like it on a sector basis, and ratio charts where we compare the sector to the general indices to see why it's been you know, relatively outperforming or underperforming. Uh, and, uh, and then we show it here for industrials. So industrials uh, stocks above the 20 day exponential moving average, you know, generally it pays to be a buyer versus a seller. And obviously between, you know, the triple M's or the, um, uh, three M's, um, Boeing falls into this category. Lockheed falls into this category, aerospace and defense is a subsector. So, um, so that, so we're getting exposure in that vein. This is, uh, uh, bullish percent. And this is the, industrials ETF relative to the S&P 500. You can see it underperformed over the summer. Why? Because rates were going down. The 10-year yield was compressing. That's when tech and growth do better, just like happened right before the election. And then they take off uh, as rates change as they are now. Uh, and then we do stock selection. And then uh, so let's say we decided industrials was a sector we want to focus on. We would just run a simple oversold oversold relative strength screen on a few dozen large cap in the uh, industrial sector, for instance, 
And these are just random. We've covered already our screener. Uh, and then we go through them and we say, is this cheap for a reason? Why is it cheap? Are there any imminent catalysts where this can change? And that's how we, we get exposure. Um, on the Friday claim and countdown segment, uh, I was asked to talk on the Nike drop that was related to supply chains. As a matter of fact, if you remember, I talked about Dollar Tree a few weeks ago and it got down to 86 from the mid 90s when we were talking about it due to short term supply chain issues and their costs were bumping up. And I said, you got to look through that. And sure enough, it was up 16 percent yesterday. That that one's going to continue to climb up to 120 and beyond. Um, and it just goes to show, you know, and if you don't know what you own, if you're just using technical analysis, there's no question you would have been blown out of Dollar Tree when it dropped below 90. But then you would have missed it and you wake up overnight and it's it's up 16 percent. And this is going to work its way back to 120 in no time. Similar to Nike. I think Nike has more downside because its valuation is, is a little too rich right now. But, you know, this shipping issue, it's taking 80 days to ship their products to the U.S. versus 40 days. They lost 10 weeks of production in Vietnam due to COVID, factories shutting down, etc. But, you know, it's these type of short-term events that causes great franchises to get uh, hammered. And uh, we have no interest in Nike at these levels. We'd be interested lower, potentially, um, but, um, you know, similar to Disney where they got hit on the streaming slowdown, but their parks are, are reopening and, and, uh, and they're going to be fine. So you just look for great companies that get hit in the short term that if you can look through past five minutes, you realize that you have an opportunity. Um, now as, re as it relates to the general market moves, what I was set to cover was, uh, the 10 year yield had moved 15 bips in three days after the Fed meeting, uh, as was the case from November 2020 to March 2021, when the 10 year yield jumped from 75 bips to 175 bips. Value cyclicals reopening trade became the leaders in a rising rate environment. We believe that's going to be the case into year end. Um, that doesn't mean tech and growth will have to go down or crash, it just means they will relatively perform less well um maybe they'll go down a bit more but but uh i just think you're going to see a dramatic outperformance and that week was the inflection and the previous week we were on saying that the fed meeting would be the inflection and so far that's proven to be the case now uh rates will climb into year end on the expectation of taper which will likely be announced in december not november pal said he needed to see a decent employment report to move ahead and we'll only see uh, the September jobs report early October before the November 2nd meeting based on Delta fears in early September and continuing initial jobless claims. September numbers are likely to miss expectations like August did. October and November reports should be strong enough for him to announce in December. Last week, we talked about cruise lines and airlines and expectation of the Fed meeting and global COVID cases coming down. They're moving up nicely this week. More upside to come. We still think those are, are going to continue to climb higher. Uh, this week, we want to get more exposure to industrials and aerospace, and we talked about Lockheed Martin and Boeing. Uh, the interesting thing about Lockheed Martin, it was off 15% of its highs at the time of this show. It's it's bounced since the show, but um, uh, they fell out of favor with rates. With the reopening trade back in play, which favors short-duration earnings, uh, cyclicals and value over long-duration earnings, tech, and growth, we believe this stock can work back up to new highs over the next six to nine months. Listen to this. It will earn 27% more in 2022 than it did pre-pandemic in 2019, and yet it's trading at an 18% discount to its pre-pandemic highs. It trades at 12 and a half times next year's earnings, pays a 3% dividend while you wait, and the F-35 fighter pilot, which is the largest weapon program in history, will fuel earnings for decades to come. Uh, this is a, a chart from Goldman Sachs that actually shows how short-duration earnings track uh the increase in uh in 10 year yield here they're using the five year yield but they track rates so basically uh short duration duration what they mean is cyclicals and value versus long duration is tech and growth so you can see as uh yields fell the value reopening cyclical trade fell then it rose and then it fell over the summer and now that it's rising we expect it to rise again and Goldman Sachs is saying the exact same thing. Um, they must watch Fox Business. So, uh, okay. And then uh, Boeing, we were talking about, you know, um, 
uh, we just talked about all the new good news about Boeing, but the other good news was that they expected China demand to go up to 1.47 billion trillion rather over the next two decades. And the next catalyst I said would be the approval in China. It's nice to see they had that that flight. That's positive news. The other thing is um, on September 16th, we posted this chart of value to growth when it was at a one year low, uh, right where it was at this point here, there was none of this red line. It's, it's totally bounced off of that. And our commentary was, if we follow the same pattern leading up to the taper implementation as we did in 2013, the 10 year yield should approach 2% by Q1, even if we have some short-term fits and starts. This is supportive of those reopening sectors that have taken a breather since Q2, small caps, emerging markets, commodities, value cyclicals. Because of their uh, relative underweight in the general indices to tech, we could see violent upside rallies in many stocks that have been, quote, summer swoons down 20 to 30 percent and we've covered a bunch on the call even without the general indices doing much so tech has the huge weight if they don't perform well the indices could be flat while under the surface you get these huge things like we're seeing since that inflection point of the fed meeting um mid single digit gains for the general indices through year end would be realistic but some reopening stocks that fell 20 to 30 percent from june to september Due to Delta could be up 20, 30, 40%, even 50% before year end. And uh, that's starting to happen. So that's when we put that out that call. That's what happened since. Uh, that's that's where rates were before the Fed meeting. That's where they are since. So um, the other thing I wanted to address, there was a person on one of the major networks talking about the mother of all bubbles. We're in an everything bubble. And he cited housing prices as one of his data points. And... Uh, while high, housing prices have gone up at an accelerated pace over the last year due to a shortage of supply, the cost of ownership is still very low. So what do I mean? If you look at the last housing peak, uh, July 2007, the 30-year fixed rate mortgage was at 6.7%. So to own a $1 million house cost you $6,453 a month. Compare that to now. The 30-year fixed rate mortgage is 2.84%. In other words, it costs less to own a one and a half million dollar home today than it did to own a one million dollar home at the peak of the last bubble in 2007. Couple that with the fact that many homes, at least in the tri-state area in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, are barely above their 2007 high in prices and cost half the price to own than they did 14 years ago. And no one's talking about that. So you have to put it in perspective. It's like price is one thing. Uh, you know, you could say that we're at, um, you know, no one's going to hire any, any, anyone ever again because uh, wages are up 30% higher than they were 10 years ago or 40% higher than they were 10 years ago. Okay, well, what's the other part of the equation? The other part of the equation is so is revenue. So, um, uh, the, you know, you have to be careful to dig a little deeper there's no questions there are pockets of froth in real estate there are pockets of froth in the stock market and some of those pockets of froth have come out um in recent months but there's still value here i mean when you look at there was some stat today that um 20 percent of the net wait i think 47 percent of the nasdaq stocks were down 20 percent off their recent highs or some, something to that effect um, you know, they, there's a lot of churning going on under the surface, and that's what we try to find. Uh, so, you know, I, I think the thing to keep in mind is we're closer to the beginning of a new business cycle, albeit maybe some asset prices normalized, maybe we'll have some fits and starts. But uh, our general position is, yes, we'll have a, a bigger correction in sometime in probably early 2022 when the liquidity actually starts to come out of the system. But you're going to see growth and, and rising rates will be a function of demand for capital, which means commercial lending is up, which means borrowing is up, which means housing formations up, which are all the signs of a good economy. And if you need a case study, just look from 1948 to 1968 is your perfect case study. Rising rate environment, stocks went up, real estate went up, growth was crazy, GDP was fantastic. Uh, and what was consistent was you had a baby boom and you have a similar gem demographic setup right now with 72 million millennials at age 30 uh, just as you did by the way in 82 through 90 so you basically look at the three periods 
up 20 years, flat 15 years, up 20 years, flat 15 years, and we're we're in the middle of up up 20 years, and we've probably got another decade to go. That doesn't mean you won't have 10 and 20 percent corrections along the way, uh, but you know, big type of 2008 type of things or 1929 type of things. Uh, that's that's some time off um, uh, in, in our view. So. Um, the good news is there's also fear. We just covered the National Association of Active Investment Managers. There's still fear in the um, retail. The AAII sentiment came in at 28. That's good. There's fear there. There's fear in the fear and greed index was at 28. Probably came in a little lower today because the market was down. And this, the managers dropped down to 55. So they'll have to chase up once the market finds a bid. And that creates opportunity. You know, as for Alibaba, they didn't want to show the stock on their books, but some smart money is coming in. 3,000 contracts of the March 130 calls and uh, 7,500 contracts of the November 150 calls came in today. Uh, this is not your grandma buying these type of uh, contracts. These are institutions getting getting their dipping their toes in the water uh, and they want to participate if we do get one of the violent rip your face off rallies once this thing turns. As far as the um, uh, economic data this week, durable goods orders, better than expected. Again, I think 1.6% was attributable to the, you know, it's going to be to the benefit of Boeing, give or take. And um, and we like to see that. Uh, what else came in? The uh, crude had a build this week, uh, 4.5 million barrels versus a uh, draw of 1.6 expected. So, you know, we we spent a lot of time on energy stocks and energy earlier in this. So just keep your eye on that. And Iran, if you don't have exposure, uh, use any weakness to get exposure. If you do have exposure, if you if we get a thrust upward, you might want to lighten up a little bit. Uh, but secularly, over the next three to five years, we like we like the sector. We think it's a great it's proven to be a great inflation hedge over time. And uh, that's that. Continuing claims were came in worse than expected. Uh, modestly, this is in line with our expectation that September's jobs report will be weak for the same reasons that August was. October and November should be good again. Uh, GDP for Q2 was revised up, backward looking. And Chicago PMI was a little bit light. So not a lot to report there, but a lot that we were able to go through to set up for the next quarter. So with that said, uh, I want to thank everyone for listening in this week. Uh, in the meantime, have, have a great uh, end of the week and weekend. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one. Thanks for listening.